everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us on uh, another of HYPE's webinar series. Uh, thank you to Mitch. Um, today I'm going to be talking about keeping campaigns alive and we're going to be looking at some best practices uh, to engage your community throughout the um, phase of an idea campaign. Um, for those of you who don't know me, haven't worked with me, um, I run our strategic consulting uh, group at HYPE, which is a team focused on the people and process aspects of online innovation management. And our team stretches from California to the Middle East, and we typically work with organizations that have an interest in engaging their enterprise, their partners, their suppliers in collaborative innovation activities carried out online. Um, I've been working in this space for around eight years now um, in a whole range of different capacities, but in most cases working client-facing, working with uh, organizations like yourselves, in how do we maximize uh, the level of engagement and the quality of submissions from a given audience and develop sustainable innovation management programs so that we can develop new ideas and new innovations year after year with greater and greater magnitude. Um, previous to entering this industry, I used to work for Fujitsu Services and uh, focused on information management and knowledge management and also had some new product development roles whilst I was there. And before that, I worked in market research where I became um, skilled at writing good questions, you may say, which has been very helpful when it comes to uh, talking about idea campaigns. Um, this is my world, um, Sustainable Enterprise Innovation Management Programs. And just to put you into context of what I do and how I spend my time, I wanted to just look at this, uh, this phrase for, for a moment. Um, sustainable is obvious. One-off innovations simply aren't enough. We want to develop programs within our clients and we're talking to our partners that will deliver greater and greater value over time. Um, the enterprise word comes with a recognition that it's beyond just core R&D and new product development groups that can help us develop new innovations, new products, new services. Um, in fact, many people can help us innovate and I think our industry exists uh, because of this very reason. We want to broaden out the conversation to the enterprise, beyond the enterprise, to bring in the best expertise, knowledge and insights no matter where they may sit. Now, of course, once we go to an enterprise scale, we bring in uh, many more people that we may always considered to be part of our innovation process, um, the software becomes helpful uh, to give that process scale. But if we begin to engage large, diverse groups of people online, we do need to understand how those individuals behave and how they behave online specifically when it comes to working with others to develop new ideas and new programs. And that bubble on the top right is really where me and my team live, uh, focused on helping our clients understand that space, understand the social science behind how large, diverse groups of people work together. For those of you who are not aware about Hype, uh, we've been in business over 11 years now. We have around 90 employees uh, spread from the Middle East to, uh, to California. And um, we, all we do is innovation management software. Uh, our headquarters are in Bonn, Germany, and we have a U.S. office in Boston, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And we have about 170 organizations worldwide that use our software. Uh, and sometimes that's uh, software that's uh, out of the box, um, enterprise software which is used to support a consistent and effective innovation management process. Sometimes that's adaptive for very specific needs. Uh, sometimes it works at very, very large scales, up to a quarter of a million of people and beyond. And sometimes it works at very small scales, so the 20 to 30 people. So very, very different types of uh, projects, very different types of engagement. Um, I live in the professional services group within uh, Hype. Um, this is the, uh, the capabilities that we have. We're undoubtedly a software company, and uh, that's what we're focused on. But the reality is if we handed software out to our clients, um, they wouldn't necessarily be so successful. So we try to support our clients as well as we can. This is part of my team's role to establish those sustainable programs. And a lot of that comes down to uh, behavioral understanding and, uh, and the social science that, uh, that we become experts in. In terms of the organizations that we work with, um, they are very diverse in nature. Um, they are all over the world. And some of them are very large companies that are well-known brands that you may be familiar with. Some of you may work for some of the companies um, on this list. Some of them are much smaller organizations and running programs are perhaps not even focused on innovation at all. About 50% of our clients uh, focus on um, efficiency and cost reduction in some capacity. And so what you'll see is a lot of the things that we talk about today in terms of stimulating a community over time to uh, run effective idea campaigns aren't necessarily specific just to the innovation space. 
actually almost any uh, complex business collaborative process that you can imagine, uh, the sort of things that we share today may be relevant to you. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, uh, so even though we use the words innovation, we're talking about innovating the business as well as the product and the service. Um, we're also well recognized for those of you that are interested in the analyst community by, um, by people like Forrester, by people like Frost and Sullivan. If you're interested in any of these sorts of reports or information about hype and uh, our industry, please just let us know and we can provide you with the relevant information. So let's move on to the topic for the webinar today. Um, who's this, uh, who's this uh, content for? Well, certainly, if you're new to idea campaigns, you'll find it interesting. If you've never experienced an idea campaign, participated in one, or run one, then you may well find the content interesting. And I will explain, before we get into the detail of the content, a little bit about campaigns, just to put everything else into context for you. Um, if you're looking to establish a new program of online innovation, then this is going to be very pertinent to you. Um, a lot of our clients are innovation management practitioners. If you sit within that space, and even if you've been doing these sorts of things for, uh, for many years, I hope there's some, still some new insights there for you and some, uh, some things that you can, uh, you can take home and use. I put the, uh, the slide of our clients up there quite deliberately previously because what I'm going to be showing you is uh, consolidated best practices and experiences from all of those sorts of companies. This isn't just our opinion. This is things that we've seen work consistently well across many different companies in many different industries with very different needs. So these seem to be common core best practices irrespective of your situation when it comes to engaging people online. If you have an established program and you want to boost engagement in those online programs, maybe you're struggling or you, the participation isn't as good as you expect, then I think this will be incredibly practical and very focused for you. So there'll be lots of good tips, there'll be lots of very practical things that you can try and do. Um, do feel free to ask questions as we go through. I'm going to answer them towards the end of the session, but feel free if something pops into your mind, just pop it into that question tab and we'll deal with that at the end of the webinar. So um, to get everybody on the same page, I want to start off with some fundamental assumptions. And for those of you that have joined my webinars before, you'll recognize these from previous sessions. Um, and it's really just to make sure that we have a real variety of people joining our call. We, we have customers, we have partners, we have uh, people that are thinking about doing these sorts of uh, activities, we have academics. So we're all coming at this from, from very different perspectives. But I want to get everybody on the same page in terms of what we are going to be talking about today. So in terms of um, what we do, there's a recognition within our client base that we want to get more people involved in innovation and business innovation by uh, involving them in idea campaigns, running challenges to those individuals. We recognize as well that collective expertise is a powerful asset. So the individual of ideas and insights are interesting, but when we put our heads together and work together as a team, irrespective of the location of that team, we find that we develop better and more interesting ideas and concepts. We, of course, want to make better use of all of our people and knowledge. So going back to my old knowledge management days, we recognize that a lot of our uh, knowledge walked out of the door at 5 p.m. on a every, day, every weekday. We want to be able to harness that knowledge more effectively, get more of it recorded and into systems so that we can use it as consistently and effectively as we move forward. And of course, we want to use that resource to develop greater levels of innovation, both in the product and the business space. So as a reaction to that, we want to give people the ability to share ideas and insights, and this is where companies like Hype come in. We want to encourage extensive collaboration between those individuals so they build and improve upon the ideas of others, uh, developing better and more rounded concepts, stopping those ideas that perhaps are never going to quite make it. We want to tap into those hidden knowledge pools, those, uh, those pockets of ideas and insights and knowledge that exist in every corporation, but perhaps are not part of our core focus when it comes to changing our business. Of course, putting things online reduces the barriers for joining in to the conversation that the corporation wants to have and uh, enables those, uh, those people that sit within those hidden knowledge pools to actually begin to participate. So we no longer need to know exactly who has the insights and knowledge that we need. We just need the ability to reach out. Of course, we want to retain everything that we capture, all the insights, all the concepts, all the ideas, so that we can make good use of them in the future. Not everything that we capture as far as an idea campaign will be useful to us immediately. Some of that content will be useful for us next year or in the next five years. But it's helpful to keep it, look back on it, do research on it and investigate that content so it becomes a living and breathing entity of knowledge and insights. 
So the topics for today, um, I want to talk about how we keep campaigns alive and the challenge that um, us as innovation management practitioners face in terms of tapping into the collective expertise of our organization. I then want to talk you through what we see as distinct phases within an idea campaign. There's a number of phases that emerge that are common across every organization, and many of you will recognize these phases. And I want to break it down, break that duration of an idea campaign down into a number of distinct parts and look at what we can do and what we can influence in the different stages. There's actually four distinct phases that we look at, and we're going to focus on three today. Before a campaign actually starts, the things that we can do to influence the, uh, the participation, the engagement over time. Something called the dead zone, which is when an initial peak of participation drops off and starts to, uh, starts to die, and we wonder what's actually happening when people aren't coming and joining in anymore. And then finally, something we call bring them back, which is the phase after reminder emails where we actually look to stimulate that community for the second or third time to bring them back to join in to our, uh, to our campaign. So let's look firstly at uh, the challenge, and let's look at getting everybody on the page with regard to what an idea campaign is. So just a couple of very quick slides to make sure that those of you less familiar with campaigns understand what we're all about. So an idea campaign is relatively straightforward. It's a question um, supported by a sponsor, so somebody with a particular need or objective or will want to get something done. Uh, they are usually people that sit in relatively senior positions in the organization, those individuals with budget, credibility, those people with, uh, with resources to allocate to new ideas if you were to actually generate new content. It's typically time limited. Um, the shortest campaigns we see run for two to three days. Uh, the longest we see probably run for four or five weeks. And what we're going to be focusing on specifically today is a two-week time frame, which has a very particular dynamic. And I want to use that as an example of what you may experience if you were to run campaigns. We choose an appropriate audience. So that doesn't mean necessarily inviting everybody to every campaign. What we'll do is we'll look to select those people that we know for sure have interesting insights and expertise about the particular topic or question that we have. But we'll also look to invite those groups that perhaps may have an area of interest and uh, insight in this particular topic. But we'll specifically exclude those that we know for sure don't have anything to add here. If we invite everybody to everything, then eventually some groups may zone out as they find that the campaign topics are not so interesting to them. And of course, when something that is interesting pops up, we want them to join in. So we'd rather keep it focused and appropriate to the audiences that we have. Recognizing we don't always know where all the ideas are to, them to be open-minded to that audience group. And finally, we share with that audience as part of the question some form of selection criteria. So these are pieces of information that will help steer the quality of the submissions and actually reduce the quantity of submissions as well. So we may tell the audience that something needs to be implementable within a year and it needs to cost less than a million dollars. This will help focus the types of ideas and insights that we generate to make sure that we keep focused and practical on the types of uh, concepts that we can feasibly actually put into practice. And you can see there, actually we haven't written innovation anywhere on the slide, and that's because this process of an idea campaign is applicable to all kinds of different activities. So yes, most commonly this is focused on developing new things, but equally it's focused on reducing costs, improving processes, uh, identifying risks and mitigation techniques, it's almost anywhere where you would like to put a diverse group of people in a room, but at a scale that perhaps is beyond the practicalities, this is an area of something of interest for you. So in summary, why use campaigns? Well, we typically get higher quality content than any other technique that's applicable at scale because the generate content is generated in line with what the sponsor and the individual really needs. And we share, as I said, key information to focus in on practical concepts and ideas that we can feasibly put together. It's quite a quick process. As I said, some clients will run these uh, over just a couple of days, but even over two weeks, that's usually quicker than you can get a large, diverse group of people together and get them to work together in a, in a practical and sensible way. And of course, it's relatively cheap at a transactional cost. We don't need to fly people in and put them in a virtual room. And certainly once we get beyond the rooms of groups of 15 or so, it's very difficult to get audiences of that scale to work together well. Certainly when we should get up to a thousand, a hundred thousand, or two hundred and fifty thousand people, we need a way to do this um, in a much more uh, sensible and cost-efficient uh, technique. And this is where the idea campaign comes in.
So let's, let's look at the sort of issues that stifle engagement. Firstly, I want to look at what stifles participation, and then I want to look at what stifles quality. These are the two things that we tend to care about as practitioners in terms of getting people to join in and participate. And some of these are topics you may recognize well. So certainly lack of awareness, not being aware of what, uh, what's going to happen about the campaign topic itself, that's going to cause us some issues in terms of people joining in. The marketing activities, particularly at the start of a new program, are going to be crucial. Lack of connection to the question or the need, again, that's going to cause us a problem. If we don't feel that the question is appropriate to us, we're simply qualified out and not join in. Now, sometimes that's going to be appropriate because we're looking for something relatively rare, and we deliberately go out to a wide audience, irrespective of whether we know they can participate or not. But equally, we want to be focused and try and make it as specific to the audience as we can. And so that's a balance that we need to strike. Good senior sponsors will typically drive higher levels of participation than sponsors that are lower in the organization and perhaps have less credibility, less budget, less resources. It makes sense. For me to spend my time away from the day job to join in, I want to make sure that I believe in the process and something will happen as a next step. So that belief in the sponsor is going to be crucial. Lack of local management support, again, is a key activity and a key challenge for a lot of companies. If your local manager is not supportive of you joining in and sharing your ideas and taking a little bit of time away from the day job, then it's going to be difficult to, uh, to, to make that happen. So looking at educating that group is going to be crucial. Seeing your peers participating is normally a key motivating factor, but also the reverse is true. If your friends and colleagues aren't joining in, then it's less likely that you will. If you've never received feedback and ideas that you've submitted previously, again, that's going to stifle participation. If there's been no recognition and no visible success, those things are going to have an impact in the level of belief and confidence that you actually have in the process. So we need to think about all of these aspects before we even start. And we're going to come on to a number of these as we progress through that before campaign phase. Also, we care about the quality of submissions. So is engagement coming from the right places? And perhaps we have a division that's very passionate about this topic, but the type of content they're sharing is inappropriate for the type of question that we have. They have either misunderstood the question, or they're very passionate but without having the expert knowledge that we need in order to look at good quality content. Perhaps there's lack of belief in the process, which of course leads to that lack of engagement, and of course leading from lack of engagement from those with good ideas. It's not just engagement we want, it's the right kind of engagement, the right kind of people with the good content. Sometimes we find that the question that we've, we've offered is offering insufficient direction to the audience. They're not quite understanding exactly what we're looking for and therefore able to share the best content that they have. And also, the questions can be too broad. So very lacking in specificity, lacking in detail, and what that means is we get very, very simple uh, ideas, very, very high level concepts, which are really well away from being practical and feasible. Some organizations require more background information on the topic before they're prepared to join in. So making sure that an, orga an organization, particularly if it's a question for non-experts, has some source of information to which they can refer to get a better and more detailed understanding of the overall program, the overall process, and the challenge that, uh, that we face. So there's a, a quick overview of the sort of key issues that you may feel as pain points as being innovation management practitioners or involved in the innovation management space. If you participated in campaigns, you may be having a great experience. But if you experience any of these sorts of topics, then hopefully some of the solutions we offer over the next few slides will be of help. So let's move on to the idea campaign phases. And I want to put this initially in context of our standard process. Don't worry too much about the detail here. Um, many of you will have seen this before. There's a hype standard process of strategic innovation areas, essentially hunting grounds, campaigns, an idea generation process, an evaluation process, building those ideas into concepts and eventually projects. Um, this is relatively familiar, I think, for most of you. But I want to look at this particular area in particular the idea campaign and the idea space. This is the area that I want to look at. What does that participation graph really look like? So what I have here is an example uh, which almost every client that we have could draw in a similar way. What you'll see is two lines. A gray line, that's overall um, total submissions in terms of ideas and comments. Remembering that comments are often just as interesting to us as ideas. And then what we have is daily participants. And what you can see is three peaks. An initial peak, one right in the middle, and then right one right towards the end of the campaign. 
And this is pretty common for a two-week campaign for a, for a program to look like this. And if we just walk through what's actually happening here, it's quite interesting. Let's break this down into those phases. So we have the before launch phase, which we'll touch on um, next uh, in our conversation about what we can do in, in terms of influencing this dynamic. We have the launch phase, which we're not going to be too worried about. This phase usually looks after itself. But the dead zone is certainly something that's of interest to us. What's really happening here? Participation's dropped to almost nothing, hardly anyone's joining in, and yet we get this other boost, which is usually a result of uh, communication stimulus, such as a reminder email or notification, and then we get another boost at the end, just before the deadline hits. So we have three big boosts of participation, where majority of the content actually comes from, and then periods of time of, of three, four, five days where actually very little happens. So what I want to do is walk through the three key phases here, the before launch phase, the dead zone phase, and then the bring them back phase, and look at what we can do to influence each of these different groups. I'm going to break the bring them back phase into two parts, because although the capabilities, uh, sorry, although the uh, activities are relatively similar that we will carry out in both two parts, there are some subtle differences between a mid-campaign and an end campaign phase. So let's look at before the campaign starts and the sort of things that we can influence before we get going. So the things that are in our control and that have the most influence in overall participation in the before launch phase is firstly the sponsorship. Uh, then we have the communications and the messaging associated with it, the question, the audience selection, and the campaign seeding phase. I want to look at each of those in turn. So it's a good sponsorship. As I mentioned a moment ago, a good senior sponsor will give the program credibility. If we have a credible sponsor with a clearly articulated question, with a clear need, who has resources, budget, time to process the content that they generate after the campaign, that's clearly going to help the belief and confidence in the audience, and therefore that's going to boost participation. So the overall graph picture that we have in terms of level of engagement is going to be up the scale as opposed to be down the scale. So although the dynamic over time may well be the same, the overall amount of content we'll generate will be better with good sponsorship. Then we have communications, and again, this has a similar effect. The more and more rigorous we are with communications, the more overall content we will generate, and the bigger those peaks in participation will be. Communications bring in um, different people. They will raise awareness. They will um, make people aware of the process and give people confidence in it and therefore it's crucial that we do that throughout the campaign. The question itself will affect the overall participation both up and down. So if you want more engagement, typically we ask a more open question. If you want less engagement, we want it to be of higher quality, then typically the overall uh, number of contents that we get, the amount of content we get will be lower, but the type of quality we get will be higher as a result of a more specific question. So again, that's another lever that we can pull in order to create a reaction. The audience selection that we have, well, you may think that the more people you invite, the more content you get, and generally speaking, that'll be true. But again, we don't want to bombard people with, ideas, with, with questions that are not so relevant to them. So we need a balance between being open-minded as to where those insights come from, and also looking at uh, making sure we don't invite everyone to everything. And finally, this campaign seeding phase. And for those of you that have worked with me before, you'll know that this is some an area that I'm very passionate about. So before we actually launch any kind of campaign, we actually include some real but example ideas from disparate participants. So we actually put in some content, some comments, some votes, some ideas, to make sure that if you're the very first person to log in, there's already something to go and work on. If you can imagine being the first person to log into a campaign and seeing no content, the chances of you submitting more content is likely to be lower than if you see some other people are already joining in. If you see one of your friends, your colleagues, another person that you've heard of have submitted content, again, the likelihood is you're more likely to participate. So again, the seeding process will have the result of increasing the amount of content that we generate. It can also be used to steer the quality of the submissions that we have. So what we want is typically middle ranking ideas that are not uh, it's not so good that no one feels that they can possibly uh, share an idea that, 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 that's that strong. Neither should they be very poor where, uh, hey, anybody can submit an idea like that. We stimulate a lot of very moderate or, or average ideas. So let's look, move on to the dead zone. So this is the phase after 
our initial peak of participation. As I said, we're going to skip over that live phase because actually that's a phase where we want to watch and learn. We don't necessarily need to make any big changes or impacts or influence that process. But after that initial peak of participation, what we're going to see is participation dropping. And it may well drop to very, very low levels. And this can be pretty concerning. You know, what's happening? People have lost interest. Um, have they gone on and worked on other things? Let's think about what's actually happening. In most cases, the day job's just taken over. People get focused on the day job. That's what they're paid to do. That's what they're measured on. And this, to be honest, is a voluntary exercise. We can't make people participate in Share Online. We can try and incentivize that activity, but the reality is the day job is still going to be the most important thing that people care about. There'll be people that are thinking. They read the question, and it may well be a week later that something pops into their minds that could be relevant for this particular topic. So it's nothing wrong with allowing people just to think and ponder on the topic, have a read of the other content that's there, and maybe come back at a later date. There will be some, of course, that don't still yet believe in the process. So they may well be interested in the to overall topic, but they're not yet ready to participate until they see real progress and real participation and real outcomes before they'll, they're prepared to join in. And most organizations will face this, this group of people questioning the process, and they'll always be working on trying to reduce its number and reduce its impact. So what's actually within our control during this dead zone phase? We talked about what's happening and why it happens, but what can we actually do to try and make sure that the next part of the process is as good as it possibly can be? Well, the first one is moderation. So actually looking at stimulating the discussion in some kind of way. Second point I want to make is actually preparing to remind the audience. So one of the things that we remember from the previous slide is that people got busy on the day job. Doesn't necessarily mean that ideas have run out. If we can remind people to come back, then that way well stimulate more content. And I also want to look at something called advocacy. And for those of you not so aware of what innovation advocacy advocates are, they're people that are passionate about spreading the word on innovation. They're not normally on the innovation payroll or on the team, but they're supported by the innovation team to share stories, find experts, to talk about the program itself. And so the advocate community is something, if you want to know more about, just ask me a question and we'll talk more about it towards the end. So where should we focus? Where should we spend our time during this dead zone phase? So let's look at those three different areas again. Moderation. These are usually people who are part of your close team. And their job is to ensure that the types of submissions that are made are of good quality. And to push back on anything that perhaps doesn't look so strong or looks also interesting. These are individuals that should be asking clarification questions of the audience. But tell me, how could this work in practice? Tell me how this would, might work in the me Mexican market. Just trying to steer the discussion, trying to develop more of a rich discussion within that audience. They may well be part of the innovation team. They don't necessarily need to have you don't necessarily need to have a big team of moderators, but just a handful is very helpful in terms of reading at all the contributions and steering that discussion towards focus and quality. We want to prepare to remind the audience. So this is the reminder. So at the end of this dead zone phase, we normally recommend an initial reminder goes out after a week of a two-week campaign. So what we want to do is to look at the quality of the submissions, look at the diversity of the popular participation, and try to think about what types of reminder we might want to issue in terms of stimulating the right kind of participation to come back. So what we want you to think about is, are people responding to the question that was been asked in the right kind of way? Are we getting the right kind of contributions? Because if we're not, our opportunity here is to steer them back towards where we want them to focus. Likewise, let's look at the participation mix. Are people coming from the same division, from a variety of divisions? Are they coming from the same country or perhaps not coming from other countries? Should we put extra effort into trying to stimulate a particular group of employees to come and join in? And then the advocacy process. So again, these are people that are not on the innovation payroll, but have been handpicked to be innovation advocates to talk about the program, to question it, to mention it in meetings, to log in, perhaps do some of the moderation in terms of asking clarifying questions as well, and of course adding value wherever they can, but talking more about collaborative innovation as part of their day job and spreading the word of success stories. And these are three things that we can do during this dead zone phase. Essentially making sure that we keep talking about the program, keep focusing on the quality, and getting ready to remind people to come back. 
So let's look at this bringing them back phase, the final part of the, uh, of, of the phase. And as I said, I've broken this into two parts. So let's look at the first part. There are significant similarities in these two parts of the bring them back phase, but there are some small differences, and I want to pick those out. So first one, let's look at what's actually happened here. So let's imagine we've issued a reminder, some form of communications that stimulated the participants to come back. But again, participation has dropped off relatively quickly, within a couple of days of, a, of that reminder email. So we're back into a kind of so, pseudo dead zone phase. We have more content, but we're back to very, very flat levels of participation. So um, we've clearly seen some renewed interest, which is good. We, we're, in, we're, we're pleased with that. And potentially we have some new participants as well. So that reminder email is likely to have worked with at least part of our audience. We're bringing in some new people. Could well be those people that were just thinking and pondering on the question that we asked. We've seen some more commenting and voting, and often this is a result of issuing a reminder email which asks for more comments. We typically find that getting ideas isn't so difficult, but getting people to build and collaborate on the ideas of others can be very challenging for some organizations. So if that's the experience that we face, we actually put into the reminder process a focus on building and improving upon the ideas of others. So actually, when that reminder is issued, we highlight some key people that participated, showing that other colleagues and peers are joining in. We'll do some links to ideas that perhaps are interesting, we'd like people to go and comment on. We're going to drag them back into the process. And of course, we've then seen this additional drop-off in participation. But again, no need to worry. This is normal. People get busy on the day job. So let's look at what's within our control during this phase. So again, moderation advocacy and preparing to remind the audience yet again for a final time before the campaign closes. Now, yes, these are the same activities as you saw before, but this time they're a little different. And let's look at what's, what's, what's a little different about, the, about this particular phase. Well, the moderation piece. Let's look at those new submissions and let's look if they're different to the submissions that we were receiving before. Has any redirection that we've offered as part of that reminder process actually worked? Or do we need to think again about the final reminder to try and focus people on a gap of participation in terms of the types of quantity, sorry, types of submission that we've made? Let's look at whether that redirection actually worked. We need to re-stimulate the advocate community. We need to look at the good content that we have and get them to share different types of uh, thoughts and observations about the campaign with their wider community groups. So yes, spread the word as you would have done before, but make sure this time it's fresh content, it's new content that perhaps hasn't been spoken about before. And then when we move to preparing to remind the audience, I want to consider whether there's any final redirection needs to be made before the campaign actually closes. But I also want to look at something called audience graduation of ideas and what needs to be done in order to get each idea over the line. I'm not going to go into too much detail about audience graduation, but I do want to talk about it in a little bit, in, in a moment. So let's just, just take a slight sidebar for a minute and talk about what this really means. Now, if you're a user of Hype, this will be familiar to you. We sometimes call it community graduation. Within the Hype tool, and I think with some of the rest of the industry, we can encourage the community to promote the ideas that they like the best. So we can set some thresholds, such as number of comments or vote score, to indicate which ideas the community rates most highly. Of course, what this does is show some ideas bubbling to the top. We call it a hot status. They bubble to the top, they become hot ideas, and that tells us as a review team or as a stakeholder, as a sponsor of the process, which ideas the community likes. Now, sometimes that process is going to be incredibly helpful particularly when it comes to very large campaigns, when actually reviewing and evaluating all of the content is going to be almost impossible. For smaller, more technical campaigns, it may be less helpful. But as we come into this second dead zone phase, just before the campaign is about to close, we want to stimulate people to think about trying to get their ideas graduated to that hot status. And so we want them to share their ideas with their friends, promote them with their colleagues, so that other people come and comment and vote upon the idea so that they push their ideas into that hot status. Okay, so let's look at the final part of the bring them back phase. This again looks a little similar. This is the final peak of participation, again, coming out of this, this dead phase. So we're gonna have a final reminder to get people uh, involved. Um, we want to get make this last push for ideas and to have that last push to get their particular idea graduated by the community. But in some cases, you may still look at everything in those larger campaigns, having a push to graduate your idea, get more people to vote on it, more people to comment on it, is going to be helpful in stimulating that participation. 
So let's look at what's within our control. So we can issue a final reminder to everybody. There's some content in there. We can moderate and continue to moderate. We can, of course, stimulate our advocate community, and we can look at those thresholds for community graduation. So let's look at these in, in detail. Again, they're just a little bit different as we approach the end of the campaign. So for the final reminder, we can provide any final direction for the end of the process in terms of quality of content, type of content submitted. So if you find that you are looking for five different areas of content and you've got four, this is your opportunity to push the organization towards that fifth area to make sure you get the type of content that you want to see. We want to continue to moderate, ask those people to ask clarification questions, and again, still push back on any ideas that are not aligned to the question. Now, I don't mean necessarily just say, hey, this isn't a good idea, we don't want this kind of thing. I mean a much more constructive uh, conversation where we say, this, thanks for participating, but actually we're focused on a very particular topic here. Can you look again at this, uh, your idea and see if you can reshape it to something that fits the particular need of the sponsor? We want to continue with our advocate program, forward ideas onto other interested parties, continue to talk about this campaign and its content, of course. But I also want to look at those thresholds for community graduation. I want to consider if all the good ideas that are making the thresholds and whether those thresholds be revised. We have our, our, our choice within the hype system, the ability to adapt those thresholds throughout the campaign. So if we find that not enough ideas, not enough good ideas are actually making it through to that community graduation phase because perhaps they're a little bit unique or different or they come in very late, we can adjust those thresholds to bring more ideas to that hot status. People will see progress, they'll be excited about that, they'll typically, um, again, talk about that and encourage their other people they know to join in. But equally, in some cases, we may find that the thresholds weren't high enough. We get a real boost of participation beyond what we were expecting, and we need to drag those thresholds back a little bit in order to make sure that, um, that uh, the, the type of content that the evaluation team finally looks like, looks at, is going to be of good quality. Okay, so um, just to summarize before we get into the question phase, we've looked at the three of the uh, four phases within the campaign space with a whole range of different topics from preparing very well to moderating to developing a community of advocates to looking at community graduation to reminder processes. All of these things are activities that you can do during a campaign to make sure that it works well. So my first piece of advice for you is prepare well. Um, a lot of the work in terms of quality of campaigns and engagement happens before you even start. So ensure that question is good, ensure it's aligned to the audience that you have, and the sponsor has credibility in terms of any next steps. This is going to have a big impact on the overall participation and engagement of your process. Now, don't worry when that initial peak of participation drops and slows to almost nothing. This is normal. People will get distracted by the day job. They'll drop out, they will focus on other things, and we will require more communications, more reminders to stimulate that community to come back. So just focus on those activities within your control during that phase. Look at moderation, look at those advocate communities, and see if we can um, prepare for a redirection in case we want to steer the organization towards different types of idea, more detailed ideas, ideas of a different nature completely. So those reminder processes, as you may recall from that, uh, that graph we showed earlier, had a big impact in the overall quality, sorry, the overall quantity of submissions that we received. In fact, this second and third piece of communications had something like two-thirds of the overall participation engaged with it. So if we only ever issue a, a, a formal invite to start off with our campaign, we are going to be losing out on a lot of this content. Not because it doesn't exist, but just because people got busy. And finally, if you're using the hype system, consider those graduation thresholds so that participants can see ideas bubbling to the top. They'll get people excited and more enthusiastic. They'll talk about it more, and they'll be interested to see what that evaluation team make of their ideas. So that concludes the formal part of today's session. We have uh, plenty of time for questions, so please feel free to, uh, to submit your questions in a little box on GoToMeeting, and um, I will endeavor to ask, answer as many as we possibly can in the time we have allowing. So um, I have a number of questions. I'm going to start off with this one here. Um, okay, so there's a question about what happens if the campaigns are uh, over a different period of time than the two weeks. So yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, you, can, you would normally expect that same picture of participation over time 
irrespective of the, of the um, duration. However, if you were to run the campaign over a longer period of time, what I'd normally expect is the initial peak of participation to be lower. So that means that people aren't so compelled to join in to start off with, but are still compelled to join in when they see the reaction to the, com to the, um, to the communications, the reminder emails. So over time, you would expect more content to come in again towards the back week or two weeks of that campaign, even if it was run for a longer period of time. The counterpoint to that, if you were to run it over a very short period of time, you probably won't, won't be as observable these different phases of activity. So very short campaigns we typically recommend are um, complemented by lots of communications, a lot of uh, marketing activities to make sure that everybody is aware throughout that duration of two or three days exactly what's happening. It's more energy, it's more effort, uh, of course, but it will stimulate that community over a much more consistent in uh, terms of uh, a curve. Okay, what other questions do we have here? Uh, is the idea of having an electronic suggestion box which is open at all time worth implementing as well as campaign ideas, like campaign-led idea gathering in today's business environment? Okay, so yes, um, good question. So we talked specifically about campaigns. How does this compare and is it worth looking at um, uh, suggestion schemes? Um, I have nothing against an open box which allows people to submit content at any time on um, a particular subject. What I think you need to bear in mind though is the implementation rates for suggestion schemes are much, much lower by at least a factor of 10 than an idea campaign. And that's not reflecting necessarily their quality, but it's reflecting the reality that if ideas are submitted in an open process without a sponsor, then finding ownership to actually take that content forward and managing that process is, is much more challenging. So what we need to do is to make sure that if we are going to open up um, open streams of ideas, what we typically recommend is to do campaigns first, establish the behaviors that you want to see in terms of idea submission and commenting and voting, and then use open processes in bucket form. And so we have a numerous buckets that are attached to some form of stakeholder somewhere in the company. So if it's an HR bucket or a finance bucket or a product bucket, we at least have somebody that's going to be looking at that content uh, we perhaps on a monthly basis. You can, of course, use the community view to help bubble things to the top, um, but as long as you set your expectations that participation may well drop because you won't see an awful lot of implementation out of that process, um, but it may well capture little gems that are of interest. So, it, for example, what you could see is something that's a fragment of an idea that's interesting in an open process, and then perhaps go and run a campaign to develop it further. But I would say most clients that are in the mature phase have a mixture of open processes and, and, uh, and campaigns, but the campaigns really are the backbone of the process. Okay, another question here. Um, Right, so uh, in, these, in today's business environment of uh, downsizing, mergers, reductions, how difficult is it to find and engage people in, uh, in this idea and efficiencies of the, in, this, in this process? So, yeah, good question. Um, I think that it depends on how you package it, um, and uh, I think it's a very fair comment. Um, sometimes organizations are going through fairly significant um, culture change programs, um, downsizing programs, and you wonder whether they're going to really care about sharing ideas and collaborating. Um, in, in some ways you're right insofar as the topics that you choose are likely to uh, vary in participation nature dramatically. So there'll be some topics that are much more engaging to people than others in that kind of, in that kind of background. Um, cost reduction campaigns can be quite effective if you package them in such a way that you're not focusing on people reductions. Nobody wants the turkeys voting for Christmas scenario, but if you phrase them in such a way that you're looking to try and protect jobs, protect um, uh, people's jobs by looking for non-people based savings and process improvements, then that typically actually will stimulate very good engagement. Growth, of course, can be tricky when you're going through a downsizing process. So normally what we say is go more tactical, go more focused, focus on day job type activities when you have a background of tough, tough change. Okay, another question here. Um, how do we find, so when starting a program, um, how do we um, find these advocates? We don't know these people. Okay, so that's a very good point. So the advocate community is something that develops over time. Um, it's not something that most organizations will have on day one. And what we normally do is after about three to six months of an, an, a life phase, we look for people that have shown through their behaviors that they have the potential to be good advocates. What we're typically looking for is people that have asked a lot of comments, 
and perhaps submitting their own content as well, but they are natural helpers. They're looking to build and improve upon the submissions of others. Then what we do is we, we gather all those people together and say, we notice that you seem to like the process. You're consistently using this type of capability. You're logging in, you're sharing, you're participating on all kinds of different campaigns. Would you like to be an advocate? And then, of course, some of them will say yes and some of them will say no. What we normally do is develop an innovation advocate program for those that say yes, and we keep looking for new advocates over time. And that's supported by training those advocates and making sure they're aware of what we're asking of them, what type of activity we'd like them to do, so in terms of um, stimulating the discussion, in terms of talking about the, uh, the, the process, in terms of looking for new experts, but also then supporting the advocate community on a monthly basis. So perhaps running a monthly call where all the advocates get together, they share their stories, we talk about what's next for the project and successes, so they have more and fresh content to talk about. So you're quite right, the advocates aren't usually available on day one, that is something that develop over time. If you speak to anybody that's been running one of these programs for over uh, six months or a year period, they'll already be able to point to you between maybe 20 to 30 people that they know that simply join in every campaign. They simply love the process. And those people can be very good advocates. Okay, uh, let's look at another question here. Um, what can you recommend in terms of a campaign duration for a strategic campaign? Well, it's an interesting, an interesting question. Um, in, in principle, you can run a strategic campaign over a very, very short period of time. The downside of running it over too short a period of time is means that if anybody's off-site, if they don't have access to the system, if they are on um, perhaps behind a VPN somewhere, if they um, uh, are on holiday or vacation, those sorts of things will stifle your level of engagement. So. Of course, you don't always capture everybody every single time, but normally why we say two to three weeks is to make sure that we mitigate anybody that's sort of traveling or, or, uh, or off-site for a prolonged period of time. Now, in some organizations, that's not long enough because people are working on sort of long-term engagements off-site, so we need to look at other ways such as mobile access or, and so on and so forth. But usually two weeks we find is quite good in terms of it could be shorter, we would typically drive good levels of engagement and participation over a short period of time. In Volvo trucks do these over, over two to three days. But we, do, we worry about missing out on something. If we run them for too much longer than that, what we find is that first period of time is very, very quiet. And that first peak of participation is, is a little bit too quiet for our, for our liking. So um, what we typically find is most of the, the engagement comes in the last two weeks anyway, irrespective of the duration. So that two to three week period is, we seem, seem to find is about the optimal. Okay, a quality versus quantity. Is the expectation to generate more ideas to select the best ones as, as a general rule? To a certain extent, yes. And most organizations will be looking to balance out the amount of participation and the amount of uh, quality that they see. So as I said earlier, the more detailed questions that we questions that we ask, the more the quality will come out, but the lower the level of participation. And the reverse is true as well. This is something you typically get better at over time in terms of asking questions. Normally for early stage programs, we'd say be a little bit more open, get more people through the process, and um, look to do some of the hard work in, in the commenting and building, improving on the ideas in the campaign. So actually trying to get building more detail then, or perhaps in later stages when you begin to build them into concepts. So yes, you will get a quality dip, but initially we want to get people through the process, experiencing it, using it, so that they're aware of it and they feel more comfortable with it as quickly as possible. We can, of course, just focus on lots of little detailed technical campaigns, but where we will struggle, therefore, is to get a lot of diversity of audience. So diversity is key when it comes to innovation, of course. We want different perspectives. So allowing it to be a little bit more open will typically encourage a little bit more diversity. Okay, and two months, would that be too long? Will it die? Yes, the campaigns typically for two months, you're going to see very, very flat engagement over a prolonged period of time of about a month to six week period in the middle of that. So we would normally say, if you're going to have it open over a prolonged period, then you may as well, um, you need to look at all the content on at least, at least a monthly basis. Two to three weeks, as I said earlier, is, is more optimal. Okay, unless there are specific reasons to run it over two months, but again, I need to know more about that before I can make a good recommendation. Um, okay, how many people should be engaged in a campaign to make it potentially successful? Is there a critical mass? Um, okay, so yeah, it's a good question. Um, in terms of 
getting the campaign established, there's a number of roles that emerge. Um, the first one is the sponsor, and the most important one is the sponsor. Well, they don't have a huge amount to do. They typically outsource the running of that campaign to the other, uh, to, the, to a campaign manager or an information manager to run it themselves. Um, and so they will typically tell the innovation manager, the campaign manager, all the information. They will assign and typically pick a number of evaluation team members, and then they'll step away and wait for the results. Um, in terms of the innovation manager, that's usually an individual or, or a part of a full-time equivalent. And they will typically have some help from, say, a communications person. Again, not a big impact. The biggest impact is on that innovation manager, the person running the campaign. And the bigger the campaign, Typically, the more work it is, the more stakeholders there'll be to keep happy, the more coordination points will be necessary, and the more communications that you'll typically do. So in terms of critical mass, in terms of participation, um, I've seen campaigns run to 10 people when those 10 people in different locations and different time zones, and there's no good way of getting them involved. But I've also seen campaigns run to 10, 15, 20, 50,000 people, and they work just fine. Um, of course, you need to bear in mind when you get up to those scales, you're generating a lot more content, and typically that means the quality will drop. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, what about overlapping campaigns? Uh, yeah, so interesting. Um, in the early stages of programs, we typically say to not run too many campaigns in parallel. There can be a risk that you get a, a dilution of audience. So maybe there's five campaigns running, and you see there are two of interest to you, one that's really interesting. You go and participate in that, and then you get busy on the day job. And so there's never really an opportunity to go back and look at that second campaign. The day job just takes over. So if you run those in sequence, then you're going to hopefully get that individual to participate in both the campaigns that they like. Having said that, I like over time to develop more parallel campaigns so that people log in and flow through the system and actually looking at what's there and, um, and participating in the campaigns in which they find most interesting. So start off slow, but then gradually increase it over time. As long as you're not running five campaigns in parallel to the same audience every single week, then you'll probably be fine. So overlapping is good. Um, try to make sure that the topics are as varied as possible. Um, and um, yeah, that, should be too, that shouldn't be too bad. Are you in favor of professional moderators? Well, in some cases, yes. Certainly in the case of um, very short time period campaigns, so ones run over two or three days, it makes sense to have people that have some form of training of how to be a good moderator. Um, for longer periods of time, it's typically simpler. Yes, they still need to be trained, but it's not quite so intense in terms of the activity. So um, perhaps it's a less, less of impact on those individuals. But some form of training about how to be a good moderator is clearly helpful. Now, I'm going to have to draw it a close there. We didn't quite get to every uh, question that you asked, but I think we covered a good chunk of them. So I'm going to hand back to Mitch, and thank you, everybody, for joining in today. It's been a very uh, enjoyable discussion, and I hope you've, uh, you've, you've got some good value from that. Back to you, Mitch. Um, all right. Thanks, Colin. And um, like I said, I'll get back to all of you with a follow-up email containing the slide set and a link to the recorded video. And um, we also will answer any question that remained after the 